Uh, 2 Timothy chapter or chapter 1 this morning. Um, so you see the title, Blind Belief or Jesus Certain. <laughs> Guess which one we're going to talk about. Um, 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. So Paul says, this is the Apostle Paul, and he's writing to a young man by the name of Timothy. And, of course, we're just grabbing a verse out of the paragraph. But he says, this, that is why I am suffering as I am. And the reference is to the gospel. Uh, verse 8, he says, don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join me in suffering for the gospel, by the power of God. And he goes on to explain that. Um, so he says, that is why I'm suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame because I know whom I have believed and am persuaded. That's a good translation. But here I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. So here, here's Paul. And he, have to, he says, I'm suffering. <clears throat> so what is the sense of his suffering? He's jailed. Um, he's writing a letter to encourage, to inspire his young convert and protege, Timothy. For Paul, this would be his last letter. As an apostle of Jesus Christ, Paul had been Christianity's foremost defender and promoter as an apostle. I mean, prior to that, of course, he wasn't, but he's now confined in a Roman prison. He lives out his last days as an enemy of the state. He's deserted by his friends uh, and soon to be put to death. What's his crime? I think his crime was sedition, basically. His message proclaimed a king and a kingdom uh, that was superior to all others, even Rome. So here's Paul is a formerly high-ranking uh, Jewish authority, and his destiny was radically changed when he encountered the risen Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus. He had been given the task of reaching the Gentiles, one of which he fulfilled at great personal cost. If you go just a couple of pages over to 2 Timothy 4, uh, six through eight, uh, he says, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering. That's an allusion to the Old Testament, to the Old Covenant, where they would take some type of drink offering or libation, they'd pour it on the, the altar where the sacrifice was. And this is, this is how he says his life has been a, a pouring out, as though it's been uh, offered as a sacrifice. Uh, he says, I'm already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. So then he says in verse 7, the good fight, I fought it. The race, I finished it. The faith, I've kept it. That's exactly the wording from the original, if you were to translate it that way. So he says, Further, now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all those who have longed for his appearing. Uh, here Paul was basically saying, my, it's running out. My time's running out. Uh, I'm soon to be with the Lord. Uh, all of this is soon to be over. It's interesting, though, when you read Paul here, that... Uh, you know, for someone who knows that his departure from this life is imminent, yet he's taken time to write this letter to encourage this young protege of his, this young disciple of his, this young uh, pastor of his, this young servant, to not only encourage him, but to inspire him. I mean, it's interesting. Here's Paul understanding Timothy, really he's understanding the emotional framework of Timothy. You know, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound mind. And he's telling him to, uh, to sort of buck up, be encouraged, trust in the power of the spirit. Uh, so many encouragements that he's given to him. But anyway, just to get back to Paul and how his life was radically changed on that Damascus road. And it is this life-changing encounter with, 
which becomes central to his preaching, for example. So let's, let's just sort of start there uh, and look at the verse again. He says, this is why I'm suffering, yet this is no cause for shame because I know whom I have believed, or I know in whom uh, my faith rests. I know in whom I believe, Some, something to that effect. Um, so, so here he is, we, we could easily say, okay, we know what happened to you, Paul, on the Damascus Road. We know that you uh, encountered the risen Lord Jesus, that your life was radically changed, but more of that, more of that in a moment. Um, this becomes central to his preaching. Of course, it would be central to his, his preaching. And this has been the subject of considerable study, for example. Um, just look, at, look in the library in there, and you'll see all kinds of works on, on a range of subject relative to, to Paul, for example. Uh, Paul, this Paul. You mentioned N.T. Wright, right? So N.T. Wright has done countless, um, you know, studies on his own with regard to Paul and his theology and, and, and this type of thing. Um, but just take his itinerant ministry. Uh, so church planners have, st have studied that. Missiologists have studied that. Uh, take his teachings. Uh, these were formative to the early Christian movement. You know, and as the early church was was um, sort of starting out in its fledgling status, more than half of the New Testament were these letters to these um, assemblies. Uh, some of them were letters to pastors like uh, Timothy and Titus, but then others were letters to particular churches like Ephesus or Thessalonica or Corinth or some of these places. Some were general letters, not to specific easy for me to say, not, not to specific churches, but like James, James or Peter or some of these were general, general letters. Um, so anyway, uh, lots of writing on that. His pattern of discipleship, even right here um, in um, 2 Timothy, we see this uh, in chapter 2 and verse 2, his pattern of discipleship. What does he say? The things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses in trust to reliable people who will, not, who will be qualified as well. Now, that word in trust, at least in the NIV, it's, it's in trust. Not sure what it is in some of the other translations. So you see it there. You look up to chapter 2 and verse 14. You see it there in trust. And then you see it in the verse we read in 12. You see in trust. So you see it three times. It starts to be a, a theme. It's something that has been deposited in someone else. Have you ever been entrusted with something? You know, I'm not sure what, what that might be. But here it is. Take, take good care of it. You know, something of value. And it, it becomes somewhat of a theme here. So this is, you know, some pattern of discipleship. So aside from all that I'm saying, if we could shove all that to one side, I think what we really should focus on is Paul's testimony. Because that's what this is. You see the, the first person pronoun here. I, you know, I. He's not talking in vague generalities like we really should. We really should. One ought to. But he's saying, this is me. I know the one in whom uh, I've, I've believed. So there's something about his testimony uh, that I think we should pay attention. Uh, the appearance of Jesus on that Damascus road was emblazoned on his mind. This wasn't something theoretical. It wasn't creedal. It wasn't doctrinal. This was deeply personal and transformational. He changed from that, from that point uh, radically, substantially. In, in every possible way you can imagine, this man was changed. He was a man of unimpeachable character, uh, but he was a man mostly of unwavering conviction. Uh, so what I find in this passage, among other things, a whole bunch of things we could find here, but I think one thing to focus on is the apostles' core, his core beliefs. And this is what's coming out. Now keep in mind the context. This is a man who's been imprisoned in Rome. He's been imprisoned there. He's suffering there for, of all things, preaching the gospel. So he's praying the ultimate price for it. He knows that his life is running out. He knows he's going to face death at any, at any moment. And you have to admit that when we're, we're put up against it, you know, when our life, when we're right up against the wall, it's our core beliefs that really begin to come out. Because, you know, there's stuff that we say we believe, and then 
we wonder, you know, like to, to what degree do we believe that? <clears throat> right? And so I, I'm just saying with reference to trusting God, you know, like I trust God with this. Then we really find out uh, really if that trust is, is genuine or maybe it's, it's genuine, but how strong is that trust? It's like a, a little toddler that trusts dad and will reach up and, and grab his hand. But how tight is that grip? You know, so with our kids, uh, if I was holding their, their hand, I forget the configuration now, it's been so long, but I'd always like take these two and go around the wrist with them, you know, because I knew that if they tripped, what happens to the grip? I mean, it's, yeah, boom, like this. The hand goes like that, and crash, they go down. So you'd often see the kids walking and dangling, you know, because, <laughs> because they, they tripped, you know, but I got you, I got you, you know, and this is us, this is so us with God, you know, because we say, I'm trusted, I'm trusted that we trip, something happens, and psh, there goes the grip, but God never loses his grip on us. But I see in Paul here, I see, um, the worst possible circumstances prevailing upon him, and yet what's coming out? He's encouraging, he's inspiring others, but here's a confession of his core beliefs. So I want to know what I believe at my core. I want to know. And so one blessing, although we don't invite these things, right? But one blessing is when everything's coming against you. You know, when the walls are closing in, when the ceiling's coming down, what, what do we got left? Floor. The floor coming up, you know, you got all this stuff happening to you. Yeah. Um, but, but it's in that moment that you really find out, you know, it's all of a sudden, if you could just erase all these other things, all, all the forms, all the scaffolding that we put up, you know, all, all this stuff. And what, what, what God is so good at doing, which he's good at doing everything, but what he seems to do so well in our lives is to peel away all that stuff. Yeah. You know, we don't realize how it gets layered on. Mm -hmm. And then he starts peeling it all away to get us right to our core. Uh, and he wants to expose that core. These are our deepest held beliefs. These are the things that guide our lives. These are the things that we willingly take to our graves. Um, and they're seldom challenged in life. So, so much of what we believe <clears throat> gets professed. Uh, we say it, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that, you know, just articulating what you believe and say it, but how many of those things are really challenged? You know, this hour of despair that happens. But in that hour, we discover our core beliefs, and we either find out that they are sufficient to carry us through or that they are shallow and, and insufficient. <clears throat> so let me, let me at least break this, this passage up into two categories. The one is, is the, and I'm just talking about Paul and his core. And the first thing I'd say is the perception of his faith. The perception of his faith, not, not how we perceive his faith, but how he perceives his faith, or the perception that goes along with his faith. You'll see what I mean just just. In a, in a second. And then the second thing, the root of his conviction. So the first thing is the perception of his faith. The second thing, the root of his conviction. Uh, let me just take the first one, the perception of his faith. Uh, let me read this again. Uh, that is why I am suffering as I am, yet this is no cause for shame. And I'm going to start here because, because I know whom I have believed. Now, if I could somewhat translate that, um, he'd say, uh, well, let me let me maybe paraphrase it in this sense. I experience, I sense, I perceive the one in whom I have believed, the one in whom I have entrusted my life for safekeeping. Uh, it's an interesting verb that he uses here, but it's it's this idea to know. But we have to we have to unpack that a little bit, right? Because. You know, when we use the word know, that's subject to all types of definitions. Sometimes it's just to know facts, something like that. Um, but Paul's knowledge here uh, is associated with his belief. In other words, he perceives of something. And I don't know, even know how you grab that, you know, that word perceive. Like an awareness, you know, sort of like an awareness. There's this uh, conscious awareness of something. Uh, could be a presence in the room. You perceive, you come into the room, it's, it's cold. You, you feel that. There's a certain perception there, you know, and you're 
you, you could be right, you know, it's easy to figure that out if in fact it is cold. Um, what I'm trying to, to see in this is Paul is trying to tell Timothy, right? He's trying to encourage him, he's trying to inspire him, and he's saying, listen, let me tell you about my relationship with our risen Lord and Savior. I perceive this one in whom I trust. Now, see, isn't that a lot different than saying, um, uh, I, I know a lot of facts about him. I've got my doctrine right about him, which he did. But this is a little bit different when he's giving his own personal testimony. He says, he says there's something about this perception of Jesus to, to know him in a very real and personal way in my life that's carrying me through this suffering. Isn't that so true? See, when we break it down like that for us as Christians, we say, oh, of course, of course, because we've all been in the straits of some pretty excruciating situations, some things that have really tried our faith. And the greatest comfort to know is I'm not alone in this. I'm not, I'm not walking through this valley by myself. And we, outside of just knowing that because we read it in a verse, which we can, um, We, we actually experience that. We know that. And I think this is what Paul is talking about here, this, this perception. Okay, so let me just say a few things about that. Um, Paul's belief rested in the objective reality of the living Lord Jesus. So don't get this wrong. It wasn't just that he sort of felt and had an awareness that, you know, it seems like Jesus is here. Um, now, his faith actually rested in some objective truth, some objective reality. There actually was a Jesus of Nazareth. We don't know to what degree Paul may have in his lifetime seen Jesus. We don't, we don't really know that. We only know on the Damascus Road, he had an encounter with him. Now heretofore, Paul had been doing what? He'd been chasing down, hunting down those that were of the way. You know, this this what they thought was like a Jewish sect, this Messianic sect. And he was out there uh, hunting down these people that would later be, become known as Christians, uh, bringing them, uh, bringing charges against them. Uh, he, he, was, he, he, he was the authority uh, when Stephen was stoned. Uh, he was the one who gave witness to that. But here Paul, Paul believed certain things about the risen Lord Jesus Christ. He knew these facts before, right? Didn't he know that? Didn't he know what those Christians, what those people of the way were claiming? They were claiming this is Israel's Messiah. They were claiming that his death on that cross was not just Roman crucifixion. It was actually an atonement for, for sins. They believed that that empty grave was, in fact, proof of his resurrection, besides which he said, he claimed, he, he would rise again from the dead. And so Paul knew all those facts. I mean, he knew them. And he understood them. Certainly he understood what those, he understood what resurrection was. As a rabbi, he would have known. Um, all these things he knew, but yet he had not trusted in Christ. And that's the difference. And here Jesus then appears to him. Jesus, this one that perhaps Paul was a witness to the crucifixion. Perhaps Paul um, had some firsthand understanding of everything that went into that. His body was taken down, his, his body was entombed, and, and all these things. Um, and yet on that Damascus road, here Jesus appears to him. And this radically changed his whole belief system. He either had to believe he was hallucinating or this, this is objectively true. And we know the latter. It is objectively true. He wasn't just seeing things. He actually translated that in terms of his own experience, in terms of, of his own foundation for his, for his faith, that it became just core and essential to his being. From that day on, Paul would interpret his, all of his life and his future differently. He didn't just sort of like, like a lot of people do today. You know, they take on some religion or some belief. It's just sort of part of it. It's out there with everything else in their life, you know. 
This was his core. This defined him now as a person. So it's, I think it's really very interesting to sort of plunge into that a little bit. So his belief was more than factual knowledge about Jesus. It permeated his waking thought process. Like any one of us during the day, we just don't come on Sunday morning or to a Bible study or something and then start thinking about Jesus or something. It's, every day it's part of our, our waking cognition. You know, this, this is how we understand things. We have this sort of present awareness um, that Jesus is working and active in our life. Um, so that transformation that Paul experienced had to do with the identity, the claims, the identity of the risen Lord Jesus and his placing his, his faith, resting his faith on that. <clears throat> so his trust, his confidence, his conviction was tethered to a person. And this has to be understood. It was tethered to a person, not some creed, not some doctrine, not some set of religious dogma. Here Paul had been indoctrinated in Judaism. He had risen to the highest level of that system, but here he insists that his life in the present and for all eternity is entrusted in the one whom he is entirely convinced can preserve him against the day of judgment. This is what it all rests, but in a person. See, this is the interesting thing about Christianity as apart from, from really any, anything else. Christianity rests everything on the claims of a person and the merits of this one who is living to offer these, these things. Um, so Paul has this unwavering confidence in Jesus. Now, I think this is incredible because of who he was before this happened. Uh, Nabil Qureshi, this was a, a young man, 30 years of age, who uh, was not just a Muslim, but was a Muslim apologist. Brilliant young man, medical doctor, um, became a convert to Christianity. And that took about seven years. He was actually in debates with other, other Christians. And it was during that debate that one of the, the Christians uh, reached out to him, sort of as a friendship. And they had all kinds of correspondence back and forth. And about seven years later, Nabil places his faith and he realizes who Jesus really is. Now he becomes this apologist. He's one of, he was, he was one of Robbie's um, staff apologists. So um, I had him, I invited him to come and speak to our, our students on, on one occasion. Just a superlative young, young man. Um, he's now with the Lord. Uh, contracted cancer, lived uh, um, about a year after that. But he leaves behind some interesting books, you know, really, about his, his testimony, his confession. But when I think of things like that, we can think of those who, um, like Lee Strobel, Josh McDowell, people of that ilk, you know, who started out as atheists to prove Christianity wrong and then had their belief system radically changed because once they encountered mountains of evidence... Um, but it wasn't just an intellectual thing. Somehow through that, right, they were converted. Um, and we see this in Paul. And what is amazing is that uh, this is, when I say radical, I mean a 180. Because as vehemently as he opposed the church, now it's, he's its biggest defender like this. But it's all tethered to a person. And... Wherever you get a chance, try to read Paul through that lens. Like Galatians 2.20. Wherever you see that first person, you know, when he does this. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And we, especially preachers, you know, would like to take that and break it apart doctrinally. You know, we want everybody to understand the theology of that. But I'm telling you, 
that this is Paul's personal testimony. He sees himself tethered to Jesus in such an unbroken relationship. But that ultimately is his strength here. And that ultimately is our, our strength. Um, you know, so much we can know intellectually about Christianity. You can read books the rest of your life. You know, you can study the Bible the rest of your life. That will help you marginally. But one glimpse of the Savior, you know, can, will just radically transform your entire... But isn't that what happens at the moment that we reach out in faith and accept Jesus as our Savior? That's what it is. It's not the Damascus Road, but it is. You know, it is. Because it, it is that kind of convincing. At some point, you experience that kind of convincing. You know, it wasn't an intellectual process where you just worked through some information and said, hmm, you know what, that makes sense. Okay, fine. No, there was somewhere in the root of that that we became convinced of our sinfulness, of our unworthiness before a holy God, of our desperate condition that we're separated from God and there's nothing we can do. And here the Lord Jesus is presented as the one who stepped in. And we see him as personally rescuing us we owe him everything. Our lives are devoted to him. We worship him. We praise him and all these kinds of things. That's what I think Paul is saying here when he says, because I know, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. That's King James Version. So I have to think in Greek here to say, I know in, in whom um, I believe. Now listen, that verb believed, believed, um, is a perfect tense. And so what it means is this. There was a point in time when all of this happened. He doesn't say, I know the one in whom my faith rests. That's not what he says here. But he says, he says I have this conscious awareness of the one in whom I rested my faith so long ago. And when that happened, it radically changed every step I took since. And so he is basically living um, in the moment of his conversion every day. That's the sense of that perfect, perfect tense. It's something that happened in the past, a completed act in the past, that the results of which carry through on into the present. Uh, it, it, it's a tremendous statement, you know, that, he's, that he says here. Uh, and then let's look at the second thing, the root of his conviction. <clears throat> And am convinced that he's able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. I'm going to suggest an alternative translation here and then let me justify it. But he says that I have been persuaded or convinced that he is able to watch over, to watch over, to watch over, to protect, to guard my deposit. Now that's all the Greek says. There is, to him is something that, okay, so this gives us some possibilities, right? He says that I'm persuaded, I'm, I'm convinced that he's able to guard, to guard my deposit. And so we say, what? 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 Okay, give us more. You know, and then he says, he says sort of like uh, toward, toward that day is what it says. Toward that day, unto that day, until that day. Maybe it's the day of judgment that he's foreseeing. And so... Um, some of the translations will add that to me. Um, what's, what, well, it, it'll say like this, to him, for example, here in the NIV, to him, entrusted to him. Some of the translations say to him. That's not in the Greek. And so it leaves you wondering. It, I tell you what, it makes more sense to me because of what we said in verse 14 and then later down in verse 2. So right here in the same block of a few verses, we have the same verb being used. And, and we have to believe it's kind of in the, for the same reason. In other words, there's a deposit that has been given to us. There's a deposit that's been given to us. And I think in this particular case, I'm not alone in this, by the way, so don't think I just manufactured this. But um, it's better to think that Paul, Paul was given a deposit. Something was entrusted to him. And what was that? It was the gospel message, the pure truth of the gospel. Now, what is Paul saying? 
I want to remain faithful to the gospel no matter, no matter what. But this is what he's saying. So he says, um, he is able to keep that which has been entrusted to him. And he's going to say, for example, in verse 14 to Timothy, guard the good deposit. Guard the good deposit. It's that same thing. Now, usually, this is a reference to some body of doctrine, some body of teaching, some body of truth, that if I deposit to you, don't you dare change it. Now, don't you go rewording it, you know, don't, don't you edit out what you don't like. I'm, I'm depositing it to you. I'm depositing it to you. And as, as, it, as, as you, you follow the trail all around, I want it to be the same when it gets to hear that it was there. This is that sense of the gospel. And you know, when Paul talks in Galatians chapter 1, is if anyone comes preaching a, another gospel, you know, another of a different kind, let them be anathema. So this, this message, this teaching, when he says, I, I know, I know this one in whom I have believed. And so that knowledge, yeah, that's just a perception, but it also involves this sort of body of truth, this body of teaching. It's like th this, this, uh, was entrusted to him. Paul says elsewhere um, that th there's this, um, <clears throat> well, the King James says something like this, for necessity is laid upon me. Remember this passage? For necessity is laid upon me. Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. It's like he had this great burden resting on him. And so this, this taught him and instructed him <coughs> to remain faithful to preaching the gospel. Uh, it's just an incredible passage here. Uh, but this is, he's convinced, uh, but what does he say to Timothy? The good deposit that was entrusted to you, guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. See, that's important. Because he's telling him, guard it up above, he's saying um, that he is able to guard it. He is able to, wa to watch over this. Now he's saying the onus is on Timothy to guard it with the aid of the Holy Spirit. So however we understand this, um, we as, as Christians, we as believers, have been given this precious gospel message mm -hmm. not to change it, not to alter it, not to soften it, not to add to it, but to preach it with clarity, preach it with relevance, so that others can have an opportunity to respond. Um, the root of his conviction. Here is somebody who is convinced. Absolutely convinced. I mean, what did it take to convince this Jewish rabbi? Really? I mean, think how difficult it would be to um, find not just a rabbi, but a rabbinical scholar who's uh, steeped in the Talmud. And teaches the Talmud at some Talmudic school, and you're going to walk in, you're going to, you know, convince him. But that's that was Paul, um, and we find that this convincing, not just of Paul, but the whole notion of convincing, was seminal to the Christian movement. In other words, it was central, it was necessary. In Acts chapter one and three, um, those Jesus hung around after his crucifixion, doing all of these works, appearing to many, uh, giving them convincing proofs. Convincing, 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 convincing. So you see that right at the beginning of the book of Acts. And then you see the explosion of this movement because these were convinced people. Now understand, there's the role of the Holy Spirit in that. But, wow, I mean, have you ever dealt with somebody that's really convinced? I mean, sometimes they could be you know, if, if it's a mental issue and it's schizophrenia, they can be convinced that there's, they're seeing things or hearing things. There's that part. And it's hard to convince them otherwise. Um, but I'll tell you what, someone who is convinced that they live in the presence of their risen Lord and that they have had entrusted to them this gospel message to deliver to the ends of the earth, they're an unstoppable person. 
They just absolutely are. And this was Paul. Um, so just a couple of takeaways. <clears throat> Paul thought that the early followers of the one who claimed to be the Jews' Messiah, he thought these people were out of touch with their minds. I mean, he really did. Instead, they had been convinced of who Jesus is, the Son of God, their Savior, the fulfillment of all those ancient prophecies, the Messiah of whom all of those prophets foretold. But the early Christian movement was Jesus-centered, both in personal experience and in public proclamation. It was Jesus-centered, Jesus-centered. That means they were convinced that this Jesus of Nazareth, and even the first believers that would have seen him hang on a cross and seen him taken down off that cross, seen him put into that tomb, um, these were people that it was in that convincing that they were absolutely transformed. And I think, I think, and we could probably bear this out, that this is something that is lost in a lot of the Christian movement today because we're good at, we're very, very good, and we've seen this throughout, the, throughout church history. We've become very, very good at creeds, at dogma, um, at uh, doctrinal formulation, at uh, apologetics and defending the faith. We can, get, we can do all that stuff, and it seems that we do it very well. And we're not unbiblical for doing it, are we? Because Scripture talks about that. Healthy doctrine. You know, you should know what healthy doctrine is. But I'm talking about the core. I mean, those are all things that come after the fact. But what's the core? And the core is that awareness, that consciousness, that relationship that we have with the Lord Jesus. It is to be just transfixed by him in, in the sense that we worship him, we love him, we're devoted to him, we follow him, we serve him, we obey him. Everything is tied to, to him. Not a rule, not a command, but it's tied to, to him. And I think this is so critical. But I see that this is something that Paul uh, exemplifies here. So our message is like, hey, um, here's Jesus. We're, we're the living embodiment of that. You know, the message is incarnate in us. So we're to live it so others see, not just hear the message or convinced by it, but they actually see it. Him at work in my life, my adoration for him, his changing, his changing me, his working through me. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for uh, a, a simple verse from uh, a man that, that was greatly used. And thank you for the Apostle Paul. Thank you for how his personal testimony uh, has such influence that it, it comes all the way down through the centuries to us today and challenges us to be as he was, uh, to be that kind of a, of a person. Uh, Lord, uh, to be that person uh, wherever you carry us throughout this day and on through the week, uh, we pray that we'd be challenged by that. Uh, Lord, bless each one and those that are, are recovering uh, today from uh, illness uh, and apart from us. Uh, we pray your, your uh, mercies upon them, your healing upon them. Uh, grant to us uh, a day uh, of just rejoicing in all that, that you are in our lives. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.